Hello, welcome to the press conference of Medusa Deluxe. Here with us, the director, Thomas Hardiman. So Medusa Deluxe is a, a kind of uh, um, travel inside to, in real time, inside to the secret and uh, the obsession of uh, a group of hairdressers. It's a really clear portrait of uh, a microcosm, but it's also representative of our society. How did you get the idea to make uh, a movie within the context of hairdressers? Um, you, is, it, is it important to talk into this? <laughs> it doesn't, I think everyone's going to hear me either way, aren't they? But um, uh, So yeah, hairdressing. I mean, I care about it. I, I'm kind of passionately a fan of hairdressing. <laughs> so I know, I know not everybody is in the world, but yeah, I do. Um, I went to a lot of hairdressers with my mum as a kid, and I sat there for hours and hours and hours reading lots of fashion magazines, and so it's kind of part of my childhood. But also, I think there's something about hairdressing that's uh, unique in the sense of You've, you know, hair is an important thing in the sense of it's how you present yourself, it's how you want to be seen culturally, and at the same time, it's, you know, you've got the backroom biting, you've got the gossip, you've got the fun, and I think you can pinball between those two worlds, and for me, that's kind of the essence of comedy. So, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to make something that was looking at an unseen world, essentially, and it was, it's, a sen you know, the film itself is about a community that, uh, you know, their passion kind of goes to obsession, and they fall apart, and then they come back together through the shared passion. And yeah, I just want to spend time with some hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sentence you say, that the hair are the crown that you never take off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a hairdressing, you know, they've got their phrases. Why you decide, to, oh, not one, that? Okay. Why you decide to, to, to shoot the whole movie in a long take? Um, I like being close to people. I think as you kind of go through... I mean, there's, a, there's multiple reasons, obviously. I'll try to keep it short. Sorry, I waffle on a bit sometimes, so I'll try not to. But, like, I, um, I like characters and people, and I like their personalities to come through, you know, to really grab you, and I want to be close to them. So, you know, it's long extended takes kind of bring you into a world in a different way. And there's also... I, I've got two nieces. My brother's quite a lot older than me, and so I grew up with my nieces, and there came a time when I was looking over their shoulder and suddenly noticing that, you know, they were just used to seeing like a makeup tutorial <laughs> like for an hour and they'll just watch it and it's you know it just flows the whole way through and so I just realized that there's suddenly there's new opportunities for storytelling and you can start to you can start to kind of subvert classic genres and just have a look at them I mean I, I'm interested in characters I want to spend time with people at the same time I'm thinking about you know the murder mystery as a genre it's kind of like once you get your red hair and you're off it's a cut you're over there and it's like it's constantly doing pulling you away from the people effectively. And I wanted to think, what happens if once you've had those moments, you're still with them? And you're actually being drawn into their world in a different way. And yeah, I think it challenges you as a storyteller. Yeah, but it had to be too, so complicated. I mean, you have a, a lot of dialogue, a lot of character to fall. How did you work on preparation? I mean, I think it's kind of, um, everybody's different, aren't they? Like, it's, it's such a kind of joy to, be able to film anything. I never expected anyone to give me the money to make a film. So I'm like, I'm so happy. And then like, you're thinking, okay, I bloody well better do my job then. So I'm kind of gonna, you know, I prepare. Like I, I really sit down. I went through three weeks with the actors. We put all the movements together. We, you know, we work together. You, you sort of build a common language and it's, it's a shorthand between you. And so in that sense, I look over and I realize that, you know, Robbie, who shot the film, like we have a, I would just say we both enjoy shooting. We both like being on set. And so when I look at him and I can see him smiling at the performances and I'm, I'm in that sort of space as well. It's just, that's how you work. Some people, I think, you know, they want to have a fight on set. Some people are antagonistic in some way. I'm not that guy. I, I enjoy characters. I enjoy storytelling and I feel just so happy and fortunate to be on set. So yeah. you come in and you do your job. Sure, another man there. Buongiorno, intanto, Buongiorno. e in... complimenti per il film, perché è un film molto curioso. Mi è successo recentemente di vedere un film indiano, eh, il titolo in inglese la traduzione era Salom, che si svolgeva tutto dentro mh, una bottega di parrucchieri, dove i sentimenti delle varie persone 
eh, giravano intorno però restava fermo in, in, in quel luogo e, ed è, sono stato molto attratto appunto dal suo film perché usciva dal luogo, della, dal luogo in cui i parrucchieri vivono per entrare in, in un luogo dove si esibiscono e per cui eh, diventa anche, eh, è stato per me molto interessante scoprire le varie dinamiche e così via, ma diventa anche più difficile da gestire il luogo, penso che la cosa più difficile sia stata appunto di, di gestire un luogo così grande rispetto a una, a una normale parruccheria, Beh, mi spiega un pochino com'è andata la storia e poi volevo sapere, non è un documentario chiaramente, perché è una fiction, e la persona che dice brucia la testa era una cosa vera o meno? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, in, when, I, when I write, I, uh, I come from a sort of, I worked in development, I worked for other filmmakers, and so research was always a really big part of my process. So I've spoken to thousands of hairdressers. There's things in this film which are very specifically from people. I'm not going to go say exactly which ones. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no on that last one. But it's, um, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely occurrences of uh, some pretty extreme things in hairdressers. The one, the one that actually stands out to me specifically is um, there's something about Russian weave in the film. And I went to this hairdresser in Peckham. And she grew up in Peckham. She's, she's an incredible hairdresser and a lovely person. And she had started a trade going to Russia every year, importing Russian weave, totally out of nowhere. Like, that is not a famous place to go for weave. And it was like, just this incredible story. Like, she was so determined. She had this, you know, other world out there. But anyway, sorry. In terms of working in the background and the, sorry, the, the question was um, getting, to the, getting to the background of how, uh, sorry, what, which part of the question did I, I don't think I answered it properly. It was, Outside the shop, yeah. I, actually, to be honest, that comes back to the research. It's when you kind of, when you start spending time with hairdressers, they all consider themselves like a counselor and a hairdresser. It's like the two in one. And you start to realize that, as with everybody, you have a different existence in the moment that you're in your profession and then suddenly when you're backstage. And I think that's, you know, that's storytelling, that's drama, that's where you want to be. You want to see what people are like when they're in a group, when the, when the walls come down, when they're on their own, when they're hushed, when they're quiet. And it was just important to me to be in that space. Like I, you know, as a concept, a hairdressing competition is phenomenal. It's absurd and brilliant and it's something I wanted to celebrate. But I also, I, I'm interested in when passion kind of becomes obsession. Like I, I'm interested in that point when your craft takes you into a space where you start to get blinkered to the rest of the world. I think that happens to filmmakers quite a lot. So um, it's something I've seen and I relate to it. My, my first short film is about carpets. My second one's about lazy eyes and they both probably have a connective tissue where it's, yeah, I, 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 admire, I admire craft and I admire people kind of having an interest that takes them over. I hope that answered it, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> the the burning. The burning. Um, th there are occurrences of it, but it's not exactly, you know, it's, it's all from my head. Like, yeah, there's a lot of research, but I, I, I don't, there's not sections where I'm kind of going, this is one person's life, this is one person's life. There's little lines here and there. C'è un'altra domanda lì? Hi. Uh, can you say something about the, the incredible final dance? <laughs> not, not too much. I don't, people haven't seen it yet. Like, <laughs> um, It's interesting that you mentioned Indian cinema and Bollywood, actually. That was on my mind. I, and I mean, essentially, this, this, this story is a celebration. Like, I, I really, I care about the characters and I care about hairdressing and I want people to come out. You know, there's a side of it that I'm thinking about storytelling. I'm thinking about the structure and kind of what, what contemporary storytelling is. At the same time, I, I want people to be happy. I want people to enjoy the, enjoy the experience. I want them to have a kind of newfound respect for hairdressing and hairdressers. And I mean, like, i don't know what sort of music you like, but I really like techno, and I like dancing a lot. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> I kind of, um, if, I, if I can inspire anyone to go to, you know, go to a club afterwards, that's, that is honestly, that would be the biggest compliment anyone could ever, like, I think there's a party after screening, so you're more than welcome to come to that. But it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like dancing, and I wanted people to, yeah, I wanted people to feel good.
And it's just interesting. It's kind of, you know, you're telling... I've been thinking about comedy quite a lot recently. I'm, I'm on a second script, and it's something I've always been passionate about. And sometimes people kind of go, oh, I don't know. There's a way that people think about comedy that it's this alien life form. And I find that when you're at your kind of lowest moment, it's quite often that somebody will come in and make a joke, and it just gets you through it sometimes. And I do feel comedy is so kind of like attached to realism and when I'm thinking about these last few scenes you're, you're really going through it and I just I like that kind of absurd twist that you can suddenly take someone somewhere else very quickly so yeah not too long okay. I really I really enjoy the way you play with the different movie genres you mean I mean uh, start like a typical thriller situation with a murder mm -hmm but it's a protest to go inside to the soul of the different characters. Mm. And then you turn in a musical, and then you have comedy, and then you have drama. Can you tell me the way you play with the genre? I mean, I think that's like, I think there's a few answers, but like, I'm trying to work out if I go for the really silly one or the really silly <laughs> one. Like, I mean, I think it's quite natural when like, I, you know, anybody who's grown up with the internet, like it's changed the way we interact with everything. And, when I like, I, I like art a lot, and I noticed that there was a change in how people were making kind of sculpture and film and video, and they were starting to collage and clash just naturally, because that's the life we lead right now. Like, you are on Twitter or on Instagram, and you go from crying to happiness in yeah, 10 yeah. seconds. And I think it becomes, I, I, there, there was something else that I was thinking a little bit, I, I like Donald Barthelme, he's, um, he's an author from the 70s actually, and he was kind of the first postmodernist author. And there's something I, see in the way that he uses comedy and the way he does storytelling that to me it speaks so much to what I think a lot of kind of a lot of young filmmakers a lot of young artists are doing when they're making now it's like clashing and collaging genres is just second nature it's just what 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 you do and then you start to kind of break it down and wonder why you're doing it and what you're doing it for and then it's about kind of like taking people on that journey and being able to kind of surprise and confound the whole way really it's um i would have said medusa itself like when i'm thinking i mentioned radical hardcore a minute ago which is uh it's effective it's a love story about the history of british carpet making and like i just find it amazing that you can kind of very quickly go on wikipedia or whatever and become an expert in something in five minutes and then you suddenly have this kind of vat of knowledge and how does that, you know, you see all these articles now of people saying, you know, they're losing their memory because they can just see it on the phone. Like, how does that affect you? And how does that change when you're trying, suddenly writing? How does that change how you're going to write? And that's what's in my mind when I'm kind of doing that. At the same time, I'm not like, I don't want to go too far. I want people to have a good time. Like, I, you know, I want, it's, uh, you know, I'm aware of the kind of British uh, sort of filmmaking heritage. And it's something that's had a huge influence on me. And I'm, yeah, I'm passionate about, and I, I want to kind of like take people into a slightly different world. I'm, I'm doing something slightly different, and uh, with a kind of, you know, I look back to Raining Stones, Ken Loach, you know, those films had huge influences on me, and I think they're far funnier than people realize. And um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> okay. As a, uh, ah, scusa. Um, uh, hey. We're here in Locarno in this lovely city. Uh, what are the, what's the value of these festivals to launching a film, particularly for like a debut filmmaker like yourself? Yeah. yeah what does it mean to sort of the, the journey of the film and for you as a filmmaker as well? I mean, this is like, it's incredibly special. Like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't expect to like, especially in Britain, it's so hard to make a film. I mean, I know it's boring everyone. Of course, it's hard to make a film, but you never expect people to see it. And then you get an opportunity where it's like, you're going to show bloody Piazza Grande, all these people, and it's like, I've never had anything like it, I'm just happy, that's all it is. In terms of the value to the film, um, obviously it's special for a film like Medusa specifically, because it is a kind of, it's a film that invites the audience in, and I think being able to show it to so many people in one go, I mean, as long as there's not lightning, whatever, but like it's, it's the right place, it's the right way for a film like this to be shown, and it's, it's just an incredible privilege, and I'm very thankful. As in your previously short uh, Black Peach uh, Panacea, mm. it seems that you really enjoy to take your characters, put in an extreme situation, and analyze their reaction. Is it true? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. I mean, essentially, that's drama, I guess. But um, yeah, I do. I, there's certain things that... So Pitch Black Panacea, 
my granddad was blind, and oh. so um, I always remember he went blind, he had glaucoma, and I remember the process of him going blind. And you do start to hallucinate. So when I heard the story of, it, that is actually, that is based on a true story of, uh, I don't usually do that, but it was, there was an actual scientific kind of experiment where they put two people in a black room for 10 days to see if they could cure lazy eyes, and they progressively went mad. And I wanted to take it, I wanted to work with animation. I, I'm just interested in different, you know, different media effectively yeah, and starting yeah. to kind of collage and put them together at the same time yeah the madness was an attraction like it is you, you're kind of it's such an absurd situation and it's comedic it's serious it's it's got all the things that I'm interested in and I'm looking for like I, I like absurd comedy and I like it with a sort of touch of realism and having you know you're on that knife edge between believability and in a heightened setting and so yeah it's I'll push characters as far as they can go probably <laughs> It seems that you are really in love with your characters. Let's talk about the three old-fashioned hairdressers. René, Cleve, Kendra. They are uh, really decadent, in a way, characters. Mm -hmm. There is competition between them, but the good thing is there is also a kind of respect. Can mm -hmm. you describe them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, René specifically is... Uh, <laughs> uh, he's <It's> amazing. <laughs> he's hilarious. Like, Daryl, who plays René, is just a phenomenal actor, and it's, you know, it's a joy to work with him. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as, as a character, it's funny, actually. So René, like, m when I was growing up, my mum went to a hairdresser called Osvaldo, and he was Italian, and mm. he, uh, he actually listened to the Pet Shop Boys relentlessly, so the ringtone is a reference to him specifically. But um, I had this incredible experience. That, so my mum used to drive quite a way to go to this hairdresser because he was a very good hairdresser. And um, he, he died, unfortunately, and very strangely, his hairdresser was called Osvaldo's, and I went back just completely randomly, and it's now called La Medusa. And I thought that was the most incredible thing that could possibly happen. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's a very nice moment. But um, in terms of those, yeah, they do have a begrudging respect. I think that's the thing about competition, and I think that's the thing about craft. And when, you know, uh, somebody called Eugene Suleiman, who I personally think is like the greatest hairdresser in the world, he did the hair for this film, and I, I begged him to do it. And yeah, there's, there's a level of craft when you're at that level. It's phenomenal what he can do, you know. I mean, it's a bit like riding a bull working with him. You kind of like, you, you put a bit of a, you're going, yeah, okay, this is what I'm thinking, like a fountain of color. And he comes back with that, you're like, whoa, okay. Takes it to such a different level. And that's, yeah, it's in the writing. Like, I think in any sort of competition, people have a respect for each other. But it's, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice to show that humanity. Yeah. Another incredible character is Gek. I mean, he starts like a very creepy one. Mm. He's um, hiding behind the doors like a serial killer. And mm -hmm. then you find uh, someone uh, really sweet, uh, someone that really needs love, that experience life and love only through television. That is something that really impressed me. Oh, thanks. Can you tell me something about him? Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, you've actually said exactly what the intention was. Like, I did, I do. I mean, I think there's, there's a certain invisibility to the people in the film. and. I, I like it when you have somebody who can kind of like, you've got people who can control a room, you've got people who have like, they can put all these things out there and then you see them in another setting and they're much quieter. And then there's also people who they're finding themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have thought, we all go through that. Like it's, I, I certainly kind of, when you're trying to become a, trying to make a film and persuade people to ha let, let you do it, you, you're growing into it. And I think there was something about his character where I realized that he was finding himself as a person and I wanted the motivation of the film to be about love. Like, yeah. I, I am, you know, there is a kind of subversion of the genre. And when I was thinking about him as a character, there is that driving force of love throughout the film. And yeah. he was important to me as he discovered his, as he discovered himself. Yes, true. For example, also in other characters like uh, Angel, that uh, great uh, interpretation of uh, Luke Pasqualino, it's mm. a character full of love, in fact. Yeah. What Honestly, can you say about Angel? I mean, seriously, when, when I got that casting tape, because, I like, you know, it was very... We, we shot during COVID, and it was quite... It's tough, as I'm sure a lot of other filmmakers yeah. experience, but when Luke sent his casting tape in, it's the greatest thing I've almost ever seen in my life. Like, it was phenomenal. Like, to be honest, all the casting tapes were pretty banging, but this one specifically, you were just like... You just killed it. Like, I was just there going... Because, you know, I, I'm aware that that's, there are certain characters in here who are hard. Like, it's hard to cast these roles, and... Yeah, Patrizio, Angel, Gak, like they probably were the ones I was like, ooh, that's gonna be a tough one. 
then yeah, Luke comes in. It's like a home run. <laughs> I, it was special, and I, and I think his performance is. I mean, it's a, when you write something, I, I'm the sort of director, and I, I like to hand the character across. I'm, I'm not going to be going. I like to work with people. I like to kind of get to that place where we're all happy. At the same time, I want them to take ownership of a character, yeah. and I want them to, you know, <sighs> obviously feel like it's them. And he did that from the first second. Like it was, he's phenomenal. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Tell me something about the use of the music. In the, in, I really yeah. like the idea of the four ringos as the pet shop boy music. So. Yeah, yeah, pet, pet shop boys. I, I grew up on them. So uh, uh, me too. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's only for a microsecond. I, I wrote a letter to them actually because they said no, and then I wrote a letter saying I drove to school to your music for my entire childhood, and they were like, oh, okay, then we'll let him use it. And uh, <laughs> and I. Um, Yeah, the rest of the music. So the music's by uh, a techno DJ called Lewis, uh, who goes under the name Corliss. And we've been friends for quite a long time. Mm. And I mean, he is a mad genius, honestly. Like, mm. you, when I don't know how many people have had a chance to see the film, but you know, he's, he programs things to his phone that respond to him shaking around the phone. Like, he's a nutter and it's incredible. Like, We spoke and thought about music for a long time. Like, music is incredibly important to how I write. And I would have said rhythm, not just of music, of storytelling, is something I think about. And it's something that I write from A to B. I don't write A, M, Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go straight through, and that rhythm means something to me. And he kind of connects to my way of thinking. And then also he just makes great tracks, doesn't he? Like, <laughs> you know, when you, it's magic sometimes when you, you're sitting there, he'll play you something. Occasionally it's way off and you're like, nah, that's, that's a disaster, but then he'll nail it and yeah, it's special. It's, it's the same as the actors, you know, you suddenly see them doing yeah. it and you're like, this is why you're an actor, this is why you're a musician, he's, he's got it. Medusa Deluxe is your first feature. Can you tell me something about your story, your background, how did you decide to become a director? Um, oh, blimey, it's not, it's not <laughs> the most interesting story in the world. I grew up in Reading. And I don't know, I saw, I saw films like everyone. I think uh, I, I'm passionate about films. I, I watch, I'm sure Which everybody. kind of film? I, Robert Altman was very special to me. And he's, mm. it's quite, it, it, changes through, it changes through your life though, doesn't it? Like I, I like the first film that I was like, oh my God, you start, because my parents didn't watch films, subtitle yeah. films or anything. So you suddenly discover it. And Chinatown was like something that I was like, oh my God. Then I went hard for Antonioni, and Passenger was like the most important thing for me. <laughs> Then I went for Claire Denny, and I had this thing when I started making films, when you start to go, okay, they're the people I love, and you realize you're a very different person. And I started to connect to different filmmakers. Leo's character was really important for me, yeah. specifically Boy Meets Girl. I, I think it's a phenomenal yeah. film. Um, yeah, and uh, Nashville became very important. Tangerine recently, I, I, it's like, when I look at films like that, I just think, yeah, that's... That's the moment, that's what we're all living in, and that's, it really connects to me. And I just, uh, yeah, I went through a journey, and um, I just kind of, I grew up in a place called Reading, <laughs> and it's just outside London, it's not the most, it's pretty bland, and I just watched a stupid amount of films. And um, yeah, you just grow to love them, and then you get to the point where you start to pull them apart and realize exactly what's going on and what, what's making them tick and how they're going through. I mean, what's, what sort of films are you into? What's, what sort of films are you into? My films, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, give me a film that... Oh, a lot of, man. Uh, from John Carpenter in the yeah. beginning to Dario Argento was m a lot in the genre. Mm. I like it. Antonioni, of course, is something that was... Are you really big into horror? For me. Yeah, of course. I, I, I get scared of horror. No, I, uh, come on. It's not true, really. <laughs> I do. I like it. I'm all good with it. But it's... Um, I, I get really... I had this thing when I was a kid where I used to walk out of everything just... I got lost in the world to such yeah. an extent that I thought I was in everything I watched. I literally, when I was five, I wrote a story. They were like, what did you do yesterday? And I wrote that I was in this cartoon, like genuinely, and I really believe it. And I find with <laughs> horror that I get so connected that like, I come out just destroyed. And so it's a real struggle. <laughs> like it's, yeah, I'm, I'm a different guy, but it's, yeah. Yes, you, may, you know, sometimes with horror, it's a... Uh, It's easier in the horror to find uh, the stylist because uh, to, to make scary, scary people, you mm -hmm. need to have a kind of stylist. So, like languages, it's very important. Yes. Yeah. So, there is another question. La. 
quickly if you say something about the, the building, because it's a very creepy building yes. for, for an address. Yeah, how how did you find the location? That's a great question, thanks. I should have said it earlier. Um, so it's in Preston. Um, Preston is in the north of England. It's just above Manchester. I don't know if you know England that well. And so that building hosts something called the Crucible, which is the snooker tournament. I don't know if anyone plays snooker. I don't. But um, it's not hosted for hairdressing competitions. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, you know, it's a regional hairdressing competition. And it's connected to a very specific kind of tone of Britain that I grew up in. And that building is quite representative of it. Like, it's, it's like almost like a council building. It's a very, it's a 70s kind of... It's, it's, I mean, it's not just that, but it's also, it's iconic. Like, when I had the chance to shoot there, I thought they were going to say no. It actually became a vaccination centre straight afterwards, so I wouldn't have been able to shoot there unless we did it then. And I actually shoot in the north of, the, north of England quite a lot because, uh, I don't know if anyone shot in London, but it's really difficult. <laughs> and so I just need to get out of London. And um, the building, I wrote the script before I knew the building. Um, so there was quite a lot of sections where I needed very particular things, as you probably know. And that gave me everything I needed. And then I suddenly started going through the building. There's a certain level of like dilapidation that's important. There's a certain kind of like, you know, we're, we're backstage. I don't know if you've seen um, The Boyfriend, Ken Russell. Ken Russell's an important filmmaker to me. And I was just thinking about that kind of, yeah, the paint stripping off, the kind of the claustrophobia of that, the small corridors. It was important to the film and it was also important to the rhythm to have a certain break in things when people are walking different places. And then to be honest, I mean, we wrecked that building. Like, not wrecked it, like we put it back together, but like, you know, <laughs> we blew holes through walls and everything. So like they said yes. And the fact that they said yes, I'm eternally grateful. Like they, that, yeah, I probably shouldn't say some of the things we did, but they're great. Did I, did I answer? Did, okay. Altre domande? No? So thank you, Thomas. No, thank you. Looking Thanks forward for to see like. you in Piazza Grande tonight. <laughs>